All right. It is Tuesday, November 1st. Happy first of the month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so welcome to the virtual lecture, uh, Telling the Broader Story, African-American Contributions to Art History through the collection of Clark Atlanta University Art Museum and the Cochran Collection with our guest speaker, Kimberly Diana Jacobs. And this is hosted by the Robert C. Williams Museum of Paper Making. I'd also like to say that this is our third and final presentation in our virtual lecture series for a community of artists, African-American works on paper from the Cochran Collection. Uh, if you're interested in hearing the first two talks in the series, they are now posted on our website, www.paper.gatech.edu. And if you're in the Atlanta area, I hope you'll stop in to see the show in person. Wes and Missy Cochran's uh, collection is just fabulous. And the show is up through December 2nd. We're located on the campus of Georgia Tech Institute, Georgia Institute of Technology, sorry. Um, if you'd like to join a guided tour, let's see, I do have a few slides there. Um, we have free 30 minute tours. There's one scheduled for Friday, November 4th from uh, 10 to 10.30 a.m., Wednesday, November 16th, 11.30 to noon, and Thursday, November 17th from 7 to 7.30 p.m. You'll find these dates and times posted on our website, paper.gatech.edu. So without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Kimberly. Kimberly Diana Jacobs is a curator and writer of 20th and 21st century visual art and performance with a focus on the American South and um, artists of the African diaspora. Her areas of research are African American and African diaspora, global, modern, and contemporary, with regional specialization in African American and African diaspora. Um, United States and South Africa. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Kimberly. Hello, and thank you. Happy to be here. Um, I will uh, start with just gratitude and acknowledgments. Um, thanks to you, Jerusha, and the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking. Um, I'd also like to give thanks to uh, my folks at the Woodruff Library, Howard University, and Clark Atlanta University, you know who you are, and uh, the ancestors and indigenous keepers of the land in which we reside. So taking a moment for that and gratitude, I will start my slides. So the goal of this talk and this presentation today is to show the context and invaluable contributions of Black artists within the framework of American art and history. And I'm gonna read here y'all from my phone <laughs> just to keep on track and to stay in flow of the, um, of the talk and on topic. So beginning with the Atlanta annuals, today we'll look at the selections from the Clark Atlanta University collection. And my hope is to edify the work of Black artists, collectors and curators and in doing so, highlight the social, cultural, political, intellectual, and aesthetic milieu, milieus that help shape African-American art collections and exhibitions past and present. So with this goal in mind, I've outlined the talk into three parts. First is context, where I'll provide more background and information about the collection and its genesis in the 1940s from the Atlanta Annuals. I'll also touch on the social, social political climate of Black folks living in America during the Great Depression, World War II, and art historical references to mid 20th century modernism and social realism. The next section, community, I'll emphasize the importance of community in nurturing artists' careers and how the Atlanta Annual exhibitions help shape a community of sense, 
And to talk about this, I'll draw on French philosopher Jacques Ranciere's theorizations on aesthetics to describe how these artists were consciously building their own legacy. Also, community was also incredibly important to Hill Woodruff, who notes in, one, in just a decade after becoming faculty at Atlanta University in 1931, he wrote that he wanted to bring, quote, he wanted to bring a community as a whole and to give young artists and the old, a chance to show their art and older artists a chance to show their works and exhibit on a national basis. So in this, we see his intergenerational aspirations in just that, um, in that statement. I'll also note that um, with the racist pathologies of black artists working in this time were excluded from mainstream museums, which led them to form their own communities where they could feel free to present and critique their own work, their work among themselves. So lastly, collecting. And collecting, collections and collecting. Um, and patronage is so important to, and key into sustaining artistic communities. This is something both Clark and Cochran collections reflect in how collecting black art is just as important as exhibiting. The annuals did both early on, which is again, how the Clark Atlanta University collection was established. So for context about the collection. The Clark Atlanta University collection began with prize winning artworks from annual jurid exhibitions at Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta University. Title, these exhibitions were titled Exhibitions of Paintings, Sculpture and Prints by Negro Artists in America. Hale Woodruff at the time, who was newly appointed faculty at Atlanta University in 1931, proposed to university administration to hold an annual exhibit with three main objectives, um, which are quote, to provide black artists a place to exhibit since they were rarely able to exhibit in general exhibitions at the time and to provide a stimulus for development among artists by providing cash prizes that could be used for the benefit of the artist's own work while at the same time building up a permanent collection of works by black artists to bring the university and community the opportunity to see works of art. On April 19, 1942, painter and printmaker Hill Woodruff instituted the annual jury competition in Atlanta. These exhibitions, with this exhibition in 1942, would be the first of 29 series first of a series of 29 exhibitions and purchase prizes were awarded by category. Jurors of the Atlanta annuals included leading artists and intellectuals of the time and nearly 900 artists participating in the exhibitions, participated in the exhibitions, 291 of their works were purchased. And these works now comprise the core strength of Clark Atlanta University's permanent collection, which now consists of over 1,200 objects. For the inaugural address at the exhibit opening, Alan Locke, a major, a major spokesperson and contributor to a Renaissance era in Harlem, spoke about this time of change. In Locke's words, the evolution of Black artists' choice of style resulted from social and psychological elements such as, quote, social disillusionment to race pride and a sense of social debt to, and to the responsibility of social contribution and offsetting the necessary working and common sense acceptance of restricted condition, the belief of ultimate esteem and recognition. Woodruff also drew on his intimate knowledge of exhibitions of the, and, and that were organized um, by the Harmon Foundation, um, as well as his experiences with artistic communities in France and Mexico. With the annuals, he created a national forum for artists of African descent that included a cash prize and critical feedback about their work. The Atlanta annual was the, as the competition became to be known, lasted until 1970 and resulted in the development of a significant collection of works at Clark. 
So I'll read this quote here from founder of the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum, an artist based here in Atlanta, who was also part of the programs, Tina Dunkley, um, where she writes, during the life of the Atlanta annual, I'm sorry, of the Atlanta University Art Annual Exhibitions, there was a clear African-American visual arts tradition amid others. And that tradition, one fervent objective is to imbue the historically perverted image of black Americans with reverent beauty. The formative works of Clark Atlanta University art collection provide social commentary on vital issues African Americans face in a biased, brutally exclusionary at worst, indifferent at best society where they where they preserve. And so on the next to it, you see an invitation for the first exhibition here. Um, and it shows the titles of the exhibit, um, which again, wasn't the Atlanta annuals. The title of this annual series was, is, was exhibitions of paintings and prints and sculptures by Negro artists. And it started off to, a, a, it's important to note as just an exhibition of paintings, that's where it started and grew in, because of its popularity, grew into painting, I mean, print, sculpture, and more so. So here in this slide, um, this is a program here from the opening exhibition in 1942. And we see the front um, of the program and the back here on the left slide. And then on the image to the right, we see the prize winning oils and the individuals um, holding the art here. And I'll, I'll note this was printed, originally printed in the Atlanta University Bulletin. And so seated from left to right, here we see artist Charles White, Jean Charlotte, Louis Skidmore, Lamar Dodd, Atlanta University president at the time, Rufus Clement, and then Hale Woodruff. So they're holding here the prize winning oil paintings that are here in the next slide. So I'll pause here on this slide for a while to just to talk about history and still within the category of the context. For context, um, let's talk about history. So I chose these images out of several images from the collection to discuss not only just this moment in history, um, in American history, but to also show how Black artists responded to Locke's call um, for the adaption of a new aesthetic and then for W.E.B. Du and to enter W.E.B. Du Bois' call for artistic subject matter that would, quote, uplift the race. Also to position these works within a broader framework of art historical movements, such as modernism and social realism. Here I'll read um, excerpts from African-American art, a visual and cultural history written by Dr. Lisa Farrington. And in her outstanding and comprehensive book on African-American art, Dr. Farrington writes that European modernism itself inspired by the abstract forms of African sculpture embraced by African-American artists who consequently represented some of the most avant-garde artists in the US. Women artists previously marginalized became major players at the time, thriving alongside their male counterparts. Finally, the artists of the Renaissance grappled with pressures of patronage that required them to walk a fine line between their personal aesthetics and the, ex and the expectation of white patrons who insisted upon black subject matter and folksy execution. And in the time of the Great Depression and World War II, focuses on financial and political shifts set the stage for this new artistic trend known as social realism. This was a style of painting and printmaking that glorified the working class and signified a conscious rejection of early modernist abstraction in favor of realistic imagery with a social realist agenda. Government sponsored programs like that of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal and the WPA, which stands for Work Progress Administration, also influenced art production while encouraging more inclusion of African-Americans and women artists into mainstream art circles. 
Further consideration is given to the influence of the Mexican muralist movement on black art styles as well. This is indeed evident in the work of Hale Woodruff. We can see it in Art of the Negro Murals. He referenced it directly, um, as well as in the prolific work of artist Elizabeth Catlett. The mid 20th century was a time of shifting aesthetic sensibilities. Again, from social realism to abstraction, um, at this expressionism rapidly overtook the social realism popularity as social, socialist and com communist sentiments waned during and after the World War II. So the images here from left to right, we see Rose Piper, Grieving Hearted, um, a beautiful painting that won the first portraits, won best portrait of figure in 1940. This was a purchase award in the collection of Clark Atlanta. Um, Underneath it, we see Roy de Carver, Pickett's serigraph from 1946, Mark Hewitt, Spirit of the or 366, um, Oil on Canvas, and this was the second Atlanta University Purchase Prize in oils. And next to it, John Woodrow Wilson, Black Soldier, 1943. Painter and printmaker David Driscoll seen here standing in front of his um, his painting Young Pines at the annuals also uh, shows uh, how a talented artist can overcome these seemingly um, irreconcilable trends in the things that were going on in America at the time. Um, as a major visual arts player of the period, his works fused both figurative and abstract forms with content that is between realism, abstract expressionism, and show the artist's modern and contemporary sensibilities. Uh, this, individu this individuated fusion of otherwise opposing artistic methods brought Driscoll to the forefront of the mainstream art world and in the market. He's a great segue to talk about community now. Community. As a contemporary Black artist, Woodruff as well Woodruff was well aware of the limited exhibiting opportunities available to his peers. The majority of exhibitions and art happenings that were open to Black artists um, occurred in the North. Um, Woodruff explained his task was, quote, I wanted to bring community as a whole, to give the young artists and the old a chance to show their works and to exhibit on a national basis. Like other citizens of color who experienced segregation and marginalization, then and now, Black artists were primarily confined to exhibiting um, then in friends' homes, churches, and community centers. The community that the Atlanta Annual Exhibitions provided a national platform for Black artists and created opportunities for discourse about the creative process that help them hone their craft and expose their art to, respective, to a respective and discerning audience. Woodruff also cites his clear intention uh, to create a backlog, a backlog of works in the university's collection or possession that would be accessible to the community. I'll repeat, that would be accessible to the community that until then had no opportunity to see the works by Black artists, so generosity. Um, this type of generosity seen in the work of Hell Woodruff and the artist jurors participating in the annual exhibition evokes, again, what I understand to be a community of sense or a sense of community or community of sense. And so to talk about a sense of community or community of sense, I look to philosopher, uh, drawing on Jacques Ranciere's theorization of a democratic politics is to suggest that aesthetics, which is traditionally defined as a science of the sensible, is, quote, not depoliticized, depoliticized discourse or a theory of art, but instead part of a historically specific organization of the social roles and community. Rather than formulating aesthetics as to other, to politics, 
this sense of community or communities of sense theory states that aesthetics and politics are mutually implicated in the construction of communities of visibility and sensation through which politics, I'm sorry, through which political orders emerge. So we can discuss that more. I hope to discuss more about community um, at the end of the presentation in the Q&A, but um, the next section here, the next section will be on collecting. But before we go there, noting more remarks from Hale Woodruff. So here we see an excerpt from a letter um, that he wrote in 1974 with his goals for the annuals. And so the goals to be held, the annuals to be held at the Atlanta University Center for the purpose of one, offering the Negro artist a place to show, two, giving him an opportunity to earn a little money through purchase prizes, and three, to establish a collection of art by Negroes at the Atlanta University that which would be available to students, scholars, and the institutions, um, three out of the country. Behind all of this, I envisioned the AU system eventually becoming a center of national importance. And boy, is he right? So my next uh, and final section is on collecting and collections. As the annuals began to get national attention, the prize money began to increase, more artists began to participate, and more articles are written, there were publications, journalists would come and be a part of the annuals. And one article here, this is an excerpt from, um, from the time in 1945, where they describe and talk about the works that they saw um, on view as a, as a part of the exhibitions. So by the third annual in 1944, media, cate media categories were expanded to include um, prints and sculpture, and the prize money increased from around 200 to 500. Um, and we can see in the course of a generation, the genesis of a viable African-American art collection, I'm sorry, the genesis of a viable African-American art tradition was here established, culturally nurtured and collected in that, I would say in that order. Um, and this was both for the purposes of perpetuity and so that future generations could look to this collection for knowledge and value. Um, so through generous gifts um, from gallerists, philanthropists, um, like the Harmon Foundation and through trustees, the prize money, that was how they got the prize money to purchase the, 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 winning, um, the winning artworks in their, in their category. So, um, also, as a national recognition um, of the annuals increased, again, so did the prize money. And something important to consider about collecting Black art is that this happens, or we can see this happening in waves. Um, for example, it picked up in the 1940s after the war and the, rent, the Harlem Renaissance and the Atlanta annuals, arguably, these were like a catalyst for that surge of collecting art in the 1940s post-war, and then went back to normal, sort of like in that between time, and it was like back to the normal disappearing act of Black artists. And then in 1970, resumed um, for a brief moment, I would say thanks to the groundbreaking exhibition curated by David Driscoll, titled Two Centuries of African-American Art, um, and there was even a short little film made of, made about it, and the link for that would be shared in the in the chat if you want to check out that YouTube video. Um, and people became more interested again in African American art because of the Black Power movement. And so um, these next slides show the programs for um, for the annuals. And you can see here the categories listed and the price here on the side or the amount, the award. Here's another from the 27th annual exhibition. And this was getting close to the end 
of the um, of the of the 29 of the series of 29 shows, and you can see an increase slide in the purchase in the prize money at the time. But very good prices for art, if I must say so myself. Um, and again, maybe in the Q and A and the and the, the dialogue after we can talk about what that means now, like how a $250 prize or purchase award in then the value of that now increasing to say 250,000. So um, what's remarkable again about these, about this collection and studying this collection, you know, you can study it not only just for the history and the cultural value of what they mean, but if you are looking at um, the value of art and seeing what makes it change and the shifts in it over time, this um, collection is um, a wonderful, um, a wonderful place to start and see. And so I, I put this slide here um, after the annuals ended, um, the exhibit, the collection went on tour, um, organized in collaboration with the High Museum. Uh, highlights from the Atlanta University collection uh, went on view and you see here the programs from Baltimore, the one in the center is the high and then on the right, there's the, um, the graphic from the Studio Museum in Harlem exhibition. So to end where we started, so to speak, um, with the Cochrane collection and noting that like in the 1980s, um, Wesley and Missy Cochran began to build this remarkable collection um, of African American works on paper. African African American artists works on paper is their focus of the collection. So, um, with guidance from noted artist and curator Camille Billups, Wesley, Wesley and Missy fully embraced the task of actively collecting prints by African American artists. Um, and about the exhibition again, which Jerushi described, um, community of artists, African-American works on paper is a selection of 50 pieces from their vast collection that represent artistic move movements and major African-American contributions to 20th century art. Um, as a whole, the Wesley and Missy Cochran collection consists of over 1200 prints that span the 500 year history of printmaking. 500, so which I will not be talking about the 500 years of printmaking <laughs> in this discussion, but I will um, end here and um, yeah, and go back to Jerusha and y'all for questions and conversations. Thank you. I'm trying to get my mute off. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, wonderful presentation. I don't know if this is really a question, but I, I think it can't be uh, um, st stated enough that accessibility, ah. you know, that the, the point of accessibility. Oh, Robin Holder. Robin Holder's in. I'm yes, hoping. we're going to get Robin talking as well. Yes. Robin is the featured artist on yes. the postcard and uh, the banner for the exhibition. She's also on the uh, title wall. Yes. And if you, you know, the slides where um, the, I did have slides that Jerushi and I could talk about the works that are both in the Cochrane and Clark collection because there are some definite overlaps there. So um, Robin Holder's piece being one of them. Um, and so, yeah. Is it, oh. let's see. So uh, how are African-American female artists represented in the collection and the annuals? It's one uh, question, question from Robert Gibson. How are women artists represented in the annuals and in the exhibitions or in the collection? Yeah. I mean, they, so we'll say Margaret Burroughs um, was very instrumental in establish like with the annuals, um, in bringing artists and being a juror, I believe she was. She also participated and won prizes. Um, and Margaret Burroughs is um, an artist from Chicago and founder of the DeSalbo Museum um, 
and also an artist, uh, Lois Maylu Jones was also a winner early on in the annual. So women were included in the exhibitions, they participated and they won prizes. Um, I will say on equal, it, the, the, role, the goal of the annuals were to create an equal space, a space of equality, so they could show alongside their peers. Um, so I hope that answers the question. But um, it, I don't know if, yeah, if they meant like what the images of women looked like in the collection or if they wanted to know about no, like, this. They said, yes, thank you very much. I think you, okay. you hit it on the head. Um, Robin, as one of those women that are in the collection, represented in the collection, um, would you like to uh, speak about um, the, the value of being included in collections and exhibitions such as this and how it's affected your uh, career? Certainly, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, thank you Kimberly for your presentation and Jerusha for all of your efforts. Um, I have to say that when we talk about being included in a collection, for me, it's in addition to being included in a collection, it's being included and acknowledged as a visceral participant in a vibrant, vibrant um, tradition of cultural expression and art making. Mm -hmm. So it's much more than just a collection, which is actually um, a reality after the fact of creating. Many of the artists in both the uh, West and Missy Cochran collection and the collection from that generate was generated from Clark Atlanta know each other and interact with each other and visit each other's studios and discuss the issues of the day and look at each other's techniques and go shopping for materials together and explore. So I guess what I'm trying to convey is um, you all can speak much better and much in a more informed way about collections. What I can add to the discussion is to remind us that we never have enough platforms for sharing our process with uh, people and for answering questions and considering very important issues. So um, I thank you all. I particularly am very, very happy to be part of the collection uh, that was generated by Clark Atlanta because it's so historic. And that kind of being included in that places us in um, an era, a timeline. And we can see if we look at the works um, of people in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, we can see a lot of shifts and changes, not only in techniques, but thematic issues. Um, and I see that in the past, maybe 40 years at least, there's much more of a concentration on personal identity and personal expression and reflection of society and culture. So thank you for letting me run my mouth a little bit and congratulations for this wonderful, wonderful initiative. Thank you so much. It's a treat to have you um, uh, participate. Thank you. Um. I'm wanting to show here too the piece itself here that's in the show and in the collection so they damaged us more than Katrina um, by the wonderful Robin Holder and I will say too I mean what you just thank you for those for those words and I feel like it also speaks to the some of the points um sorry I was trying to um make with or tease out with this sense of community and this communities of sense, how it was um, these exhibitions um, were a space of community for artists and how I think this is something Jerusha, you and Jamal talked about too in one of the first talks as it relates to um, the printmaking workshops being a space of community too or artists forming studios around their practices. So um, yeah. Yeah, and then the, the other leg to that is the uh, uh, the 
relationship between the artist, but also the relationship between artists and collectors. Um, and so I'm going to come back to, we've tried to get uh, uh, Lewis on to talk, uh, who's in a, has an ama a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful collection. Um, and he had an early question, so I'll bring that up and then um, see if he might be able to comment in the, in the chat about yeah. being a, um, uh, a collector and building relationship with artists. Uh, but his question was, is the works that you showed located in other public collections? So or is it primarily you. housed just at, at the, the AUC? Yeah, I would say for the paintings and sculpture for the early works of the annuals, those are, I mean, for the work, yes, those the collection at Clark is the only place in which they are, they, you know, are um, housed. And yet, you know, C Clark does actively lend works of art to various other institutions. Um, that again, starting back in 1970 with the collaboration with the High Museum. And so um, that is one other way to, um, some to see works from the collection. Um, when they're not on view at the museum. Also, um, the yes side of that are that the prints, the works on paper, some of the ones that are in the, the Cochrane collection, we also have some of those at um, in the Clark collection as well. So, um, yes. Located in other public collections, yes. So out of the 50 prints that are that's in the Community of Artists exhibition, I'll say, um, and I'm looking at, I highlighted each one on the exhibit, um, on the checklist that was in clock and made a note. I think there were about 10, eight to 10 pieces, um, more or less. Um, so if you can't see them on view now at Clark, you can see them in um, the Cochrane collection on view at the Paper Museum. Um, Maybe not. There's one, two, three, maybe four. On view through December 2nd. Yeah. Oh. Um, and some overlap too in an artist. If if it's if the artwork itself isn't in the collection, um, at like it showing it like in both, then um the uh, some of also overlap in the artists that are presented in um in both collections. So um yeah. And uh, going back, thinking about um, Robin's piece, um, that one was actually a purchase um, by the museum. It was an actual purchase and added into the collection that way, because over time, and this is um, during Tina's tenure as director, a lot of funds were raised in order to buy um, buy more art, more contemporary works for the collection. So that piece is from 2005. Um, and I believe was also bought, was bought from Stella Jones Gallery um, in New Orleans, a black owned gallery. So um, I really, you know, I pointed that out because to it's supporting black art and supporting black artists and galleries. So it's, you know, through this collecting process and then it goes into a collection. I mean, and she's, her work is in the, uh, at the Driscoll Center um, in Maryland, I mean, they have an extensive body of work um, uh, from Robin. So um, and yeah, so we share overlap in other iconic collections too. Uh, so I have a, a, a question that kind of um, thinking about the financial support piece of, of, of this in that, um, you mentioned in your presentation that artists had to walk a fine line between their, maybe their personal aesthetic and um, the uh, collector's vision of what black artists should be, should do. Um, would you say, and this is also a question for you, Robin, um, that that is still an issue for uh, black artists 
walking that line between um, uh, individual voice and uh, maybe limited expectations for um, artists of color? Darusha, what, can you rephrase the question again? So, um, in some, for lack of a better way of saying it, so in some circles, and I don't know that it's as much an issue now, but I'm, I'm curious, um, Black art for many people means a representation of uh, Black people, Black culture versus Black art being whatever a Black artist produces, whether there's a, a, a clear um, uh, I don't know. Darusha, I think I know where you're going with this. This is one of those age old, um, fascinating and never ending questions. And basically, I think it's related to should African American artists or artists of color do abstract work or conceptual work? Or should African American artists or artists of color focus on um, depicting more figurative imagery that conveys the variety or different aspects of the quote African American life and times? And I think that the one of the things is there is no such thing in my understanding as a black art world. There are artists who are very conceptual, like Fred Wilson, you have artists who do non-figurative work that involves the exploration of a focal point or a theme, or like Mel Edwards or William T. Williams or Nanette Carter. And you have artists whose work is more um, involved in showing, expressing, celebrating, and exploring um, various aspects of Black life. And that work often tends to be more figurative and is sometimes considered as a category close to illustrative work. And then there are artists who really focus on specific themes. Um, it might be issues regarding environmental climate change. It might be issues such as myself involving racism, classism, and um, identity. It might be LGBT issues. It might be things having to do with healing and spirituality. So I think we, at this point in the beginning of the 21st century, have given ourselves permission to do what occurs to us. I think one of the elements that some of the artists wrestle with is how are they going to um, market their work and is the kind of imagery they're generating uh, marketable and that's where I think you get a lot of challenging approaches and, and difficulties <clears throat> because um, the creative process in my estimation is an adventure or an exploration where you really should not really not know what's going to end up being the final product. Because if you're creating, you should be submitting to some element where you can't be in complete um, control of what's going on rationally. But the problem with that is that it's hard to disseminate through the marketplace work that you can't um, expect or that, that is not uh, predictable. So we have a very, very serious problem and I think it's getting to be more and more of a problem and it has to do with how many artists who are known and have wide platforms and are highly visible are doing more of fabricating or producing something they've already um, generated and doing it over and over again, or are they truly exploring? Mm. I like that point, Robin. Yes. Yeah. I mean, every, uh, every, 
it's it's yes. difficult. <laughs> It's a, it's a, if I, if I may, can I respond to Joyce or just piggyback on what you're saying here, because, you know, two, three, two things come up for me. And thank you for that. I mean, when you look at artists like William H. Johnson, who is incredibly talented um, artist, I mean, even Hale Woodruff w went into abstraction, but William H. Johnson is, you know, it is, can see, be seen as an example of someone who changed his style specifically to appeal to this folksy time, you know, this style that white patrons at the time were very much um, wanting to buy. They were, that's what, you know, and he, as an artist wanting to make a living, acquiesced to those, you know, to what his patrons prefer to those preferences um, which inevitably, you know, became the style that he is most known for of his in his paintings. But also, it kind of dropped, you know, it, it led to some very much psychological breakdowns and issues in him personally um, during his later years in Copenhagen, where he was really grappling with his own identity and how he would and should express. So, you know, wanting to, and I say that to making, wanting to make a living and acquiescing to the wants of others outside of yourself can often be challenging. And for artists who are sensitive to the times, who, like you said, Robin, are on a journey to explore themselves is what I believe. And this is something Driscoll, I think, and what you kind of do, I mean, artists, yes, go into that space of creation and create from that. And, and also like now with this return to what at the time could be considered as social realism, responding to depression, war, et cetera, you can see artists, or I've, I've also noticed that trend you picked up on that you mentioned, like they're producing the same work, different styles over and again. And I would say arguably that is more so for audiences for content. It's now, you know, our, our, our um, output is driven by marketing, branding, by capitalism um, and the, and the, and the compulsion to create content that is a part of that. So, you know, in order potentially for artists to return to that exploration, one, we got to end capitalism. <laughs> I mean, two, it is to look back. I mean, not just at the self, we see ourselves, you know, but to look inside and not at others, which again, you know, this is, yeah. I think one of the things that can help in that regard is um, Americans uh, are, tend to be very focused on the material final product. Mm -hmm. And if we spent more time educating um, our youngsters and people in general on what the creative process it, itself is, which is basically a kind of a brainstorming and reflective process, if we spent more time trying to understand what that progress or progression or adventure or challenges for artists, because it's not always a particularly enjoyable thing when you're creating, because you often artists will put themselves in a position of trying to do something that's really not possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to cre create something that's a feeling, that's a belief, that's a, an experiential reality, that's um, a prayer uh, or a reaction to your world around you and put it in finite terms and create a material object. So um, the, the creative process, I think if we spend more time really uh, understanding what artists' creative process is and what the unique characteristics of each artist is, we could address that issue. Mm. Agreed, indeed. And right. that, oh. oh, go ahead. Well, we've go got ahead. five more minutes. I, you know, this this conversation could continue <laughs> indefinitely. But I'll I'll just say thank you to. I saw a, something from Adrian who uh, said yes, process over product, process over product. Um, so nice punctuation there. Thank you, Adrian B. I was just about to play devil's advocate and ask you, though, do you think that we're actually moving further away from that when um, we look at how um, social media works, how, how much we rely on social media 
And so maybe the first time something is done, it's experimental and fresh and new. And then we see it kind mm -hmm. of mimicked and repeated a million times <laughs> and shared a million times. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can thank algorithms for that. I mean, we can thank technology yeah. algorithms. And, you know, but that's also what I meant with regards to the, the compulsive for content. Um, you know, an artist in the studio, you know, posting and painting, you know, pictures about them in the studio and content about their work allows collectors to sort of a glimpse inside of their process, um, which, you know, is, I think, and, and like, you know, yeah, an interesting way or a new way that is very, you know, that is important in how we experience art today. Um, in comparison to say like the purchase awards, the purchase prizes, these were, you know, done by jurors of peers who really, really thought about, you know, the, the rigor, the work, the artist and all of the things. Um, they were somewhat affirming in a way an artist practice. And yet it did not hinder Lois Maylou Jones from painting all types of things, right? She went from water, I mean, she's done all kind of, you know, uh, you can see all kinds of styles in a number of artists. So, you know, it's like these, um, and it's what, how do we say, artists shape taste, you know, and, or, or art or taste is shaped by the artist in a way, but, you know, <laughs> It's different, I think, when a collector may decide to um, now, like it's about like collecting on on, on mass. You know, if I get one Kahinde, if I won't get one Kahinde Wiley, I want the whole series. I want them all. I mean, this is a remarkable thing for say printmakers and people who work in that. You know, you know, um, who can do and make styles and you know mass produce their art in a way that can reach. Um, Lots of people always think about printmaking as a art of generosity because you have so many, you can spread them out um, liberally, you know, depending on the number that you create. But at any rate, um, I think it is important to consider the way we collect and what, and especially for influential collectors and for them to affirm an artist versus just focusing on the acquisition and the value because imbuing again, the value and putting that into the work, into an artist's practice, it will inherently um, begin to increase in value by way of affirm yeah, affirming. Thank you so much, um, both, both Kimberly and Robin. That, that was just a treat to have, to, uh, have you all on and I'm uh, so sad that the technology was fighting a, a, against this, Lewis, because I would have loved to have had your voice, especially as a collector, um, uh, on the talk as well. Um, just a few more things before we go. Our official farewell. We appreciate this talk and discussion. Thank you to Adrian. Um, uh, we will be posting uh, Kimberly's contact information in the chat as well. If you'd like to check out her Instagram, her website, um, get in touch about future presentations or curatorial opportunities, um, her um, information is um, in the chat. Uh, I'd also like to um, just let folks know what's going on at the uh, paper museum. If you are in the Atlanta area, we have um, a couple of workshops coming up, uh, in-person workshops um, on November 10th, a paste paper workshop. That's the image in the uh, upper left-hand corner. Um, on November 15th, we'll be doing a screen print with Jamal Barber who uh, gave a presentation uh, earlier for this virtual lecture series. And if you missed that virtual lecture series, or if you wanna come back and listen to this one, um, all of the uh, uh, virtual presentations have been recorded and are posted on our website. Give us about a week to get this one 
um, up. And then um, we have a, a, another uh, free virtual lecture um, on, in December 1st. Let's see. So I've got the chat window covering the title Heritage of Indian Papermaking. So please join us for that. That'll be 8 to 9 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All of these things can be. Um, uh, are, are listed on our website, again, paper.gatech.edu. Um, and then uh, Anna is going to post her contact information in the chat as well if you want to register for one of the workshops. And again, um, guided tours, November 4th, 10 a.m., November 16th, 11.30 a.m., and uh, November 17th at 7 p.m. Um, the museum is free and open to the public from nine to five, Monday through Friday. But if you come at these times, um, there will be a, a 30 minute guided tour. And then here's our information. If you enjoyed um, this presentation, you could find more content on our uh, social media. And um, if you'd like to, we talked about the financial support. If you'd like to uh, support uh, these programs financially, make it possible for us to continue to offer uh, free programming, um, you can donate to us at mygeorgiatech.gatech.edu uh, backslash giving backslash papermaking dash museum. It's long, but worthy. <laughs> title. Thank you so much for attending the program. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Robin. Um, thank you all uh, that attended. We appreciate you. Good night. Good night.